I want to thank you for coming. And I, just the talk that I'm going to give is a combination of things. <coughs> it comes from technical work that I've done on communicative dynamics and reputational systems, but also on actual programs I'm trying to build to create opportunities for social science to make a difference. Um, I have leadership positions at the National Academies and the National Science Foundation that are trying to improve the communication use of social science. And so what I'm going to show you is a mix of these two things, but I'm really going to try and make it about you. So um, I think that for political science to remain relevant, it has to continually reinvent itself. Whenever we have advances in the knowledge base, when we have new advances in technology, or when the world changes, we have to adapt to it aggressively and rigorously. Right? One of the things I like about being on this panel, and if you have a chance, you should read the papers. You can see in these papers really like the vanguard of what this discipline is and can become in terms of its use of data and its kind of responsi the responsibility with which it's teach, uh, treating really basic questions about how do we know what we know. So that's really critical. But there's another issue. If you like this type of work, if you want to do this type of work, if you want to get jobs, if you want the public sector to give you grants for this type of work or the private sector to give you contracts, if you want to publish this type of work, it's kind of easy to publish now because the internet. And you just put it on there and like it's published in some way. But if you want people to read it and you want it to make a difference, like how's that going to work? Because the same changes that enable new types of political science are also changing expectations about how people use information and what they think of science and whether or not they will take the time to think about your work. So what I want to walk through is how that some things that are happening right now that could affect the value of what we do and things that you and I can do right now, plus organizations, to try and increase the value of the work that we're doing, which is, I think, tremendous. I mean, do take a, a, some time, if you can, to read the other papers on the panel. So and I'm going to, if you want to do science for its own sake, and which is, I love that, and if you don't want the private or public sector to support you, everything I say is like irrelevant. Just go like and do it. If you want somebody to pay you or support to do it, uh, what I'm going to say is I think entirely relevant. So, what's our mission as scientists, right? And you can think of it a lot of different ways. But when you're trying to get somebody else to support it, uh, the story has to be about quality of life, right? That what we're doing somehow can make a process more effective or efficient. It might be a scientific process or a machine algorithm or something like that, or it might be help people live. Whether we can lift people out of poverty or whether we can take a conflict situation in a particular country and manage it in a more effective way. You know, we can do basic or applied research, but somebody in the food chain has to be able to tell a story about what we're doing that relates to quality of life. Otherwise, it's very hard to get people in the private or public sector to pay attention to us or want to throw money our way. So in a sense, what we provide is, is clarity, okay? But we provide clarity by selling a certain type of product. There's a certain type, sorry to kind of bring it to that level. But there's a certain type of product that all of us sell. Um, we sell information and meaning. So the information that we sell is the data we collect, the observations we record, even the way that we kind of categorize it initially. The meaning that we sell are through the analyses that we run and the interpretations that we offer. Those are the two things that, that we give. And, and information and meaning are, are like really powerful things. Right? If we give people more rigorous, more accurate ways of understanding the social and natural world, you know, they can do things that, that, are really, that are really powerful, that have changed the way that we live. So that's a great thing, right? And, and you know, one thing I want to say before, some dark clouds are going to occur pretty soon. One fact you should know about social science today. It is being used by more people in more places around the world to solve more problems than ever before. Right in the private and public sector. So we hear about threats to social science and so forth, and they're real. But the other reality is there, there's nothing like today, there's nothing like now, in the number of people who are using our methods and trying to use our knowledge base to improve quality of life or effectiveness or efficiency. Right? But the question is, will that continue, and how do we be a part of it? So I promised some dark clouds. Um, uh, here's, here's another issue. So these two things we sell are information and meaning. And the one, one other fact I want to convey to you is that the marketplace for these two products has changed dramatically in the time that all of you have been in, in school, in college. In the last, let's say, 10 years, the marketplace has completely transformed. Okay? Um, 
we used to, at universities, provide knowledge, and people would defer to us, right? We used to ask governments for money, and they'd say, well, you're a scientist, you know, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Times are changing, and they're not changing because, like, a new brand of evil has come up in the world, right? That might be a part of it, but they're changing for reasons that are totally predictable if you think about what would happen if a lot more people could provide information and meaning. What would happen if you change the number of competitors in the marketplace? So we have these now threats to science. Maybe we deny science or we don't want to fund it. We don't want to fund universities. We don't want to fund social science at the NSF. And people hear this and they, and they say, but they don't understand how important we are. They don't understand. <coughs> Okay? And so that's a, we, we are really good like, in science at, at a couple things. One is like meaning and the other is information and the other is righteous indignation when anybody tries to touch our stuff. Right? <laughs> and so that's a common reaction. Like one manifestation is how dare Congress try to politicize the peer review process. Okay? So that's an interesting proposition to put out there um, for, for the following reasons. So I, I want to now think through all those problems and why they're occurring. And what I want to show you is two things that we thought in the academy was true and that are now over. They're officially over. Okay, one, um, universities had a thousand year near monopoly on the provision and distribution of certain types of information, including most of the types of information that we produce. We had a near monopoly. Now, because of the internet, there are lots of people who make knowledge claims, who claim to know things, and a lot of them use numbers, and some of them have fancy graphs. And no offense to anyone in the room, but a lot of them write better than we do, faster than we do, and they're less expensive than we are. Okay? And so there are a number of people who are asking, why do we need you again? Okay? And some of the, so the criticisms you hear of science and science funding are coming from that increased competition in the marketplace. There's another thing. Blank checks from Congress. Um, if you look at the way that Congress has talked about science, let's say over the last 70 years, um, after the Second World War, the conversation changed. And the reason was many people in Washington credited science with winning the war. There were three critical scientific contributions to the US effort in the Second World War. Code breaking, radar, nuclear. Right? So for decades, Congress was, was willing to say, here's science money, you guys do your stuff. But now we're in an era where there's competition, where many people in Congress say, this work that you're doing, other people can do it. We don't really need to know it, right? And we don't need to pay you, and plus you're all liberal, right? And so we don't really want to pay for this. And the era where Congress has stopped asking questions, again, that's over. And you can say whether it's partisan reasons or whatever, but in a, in the mar in a, in a competitive marketplace, so these are done. So what do we do? There's a strategy. It's a pretty simple strategy that you and I can do and that organizations can do. And we have to serve people better. The products that we produce, the information and the meaning, has to be more <coughs> valuable. The efforts in this room are a critical part of it. The transparency, the rigor. Because if you think about it, lots of people make knowledge claims. But what's true about, what the great thing about science is if I do work and I've documented everything and I've been rigorous about everything and I hand it to you and you do it, the answer should be the same. It's not true because of who I am or where I came from. It's true because of the process. It's true because of the rigor. And what if you, you know, religion can teach you great things, culture can teach you great things, but usually they're specific to people in a certain group. And the amazing thing about science is that it's supposed to be true regardless of who did it. That's our ace in the hole, right? That's our, that's the thing, but we can't let that go. We can't decide to hand wave at certain moments because it's convenient for us. And so, you know, I've been involved in some transparency efforts in the discipline. I think it's a core part of like what we need to do to remain relevant. Because if we sacrifice that individually or collectively, the answer to why people need you becomes really unpleasant for us. Because a lot of people hand wave better than we do. All right. So how do we think about science as service? How can we increase the value? So the critical thing is if you want other people to support science, I'm not talking about whether it's good or not, right? H how do we think about it as service? And so I want to put out three factors. Right? And this is the basic research I'm doing now. One is we have to improve communication. When you're a monopolist and you give a crappy presentation that no one can understand, you get to say, oh, where else are you going to go? Right? Figure it out. Sit here and figure it out. And if you can't, it's because you're an idiot. Right? And so that worked, and that was fine. But in a competitive marketplace where other people are claiming to know what we know, now if some people give a better story that's wrong, they might win the battle, right? And the question is, do we want to do that? So we can communicate more effectively. And for me, I just, this is, I spend most of my life working on science communication. This isn't about dumbing things down. This is about being a lot smarter 
about how to convey what you know. It's about finding both the rigor and then finding analogies, metaphors, and examples that can convey the true content of what you've done, but in a way that's accessible to others. And if you think it's an either or, like seriously, have we actually tried to do this? Right? Most of our professional incentives are to give presentations to people who are trained almost exactly the same as us and who have almost exactly the same research interests as us. We don't say that, we just call them the ideal reviewer at a journal. We call them the ideal discussant. Okay? And there's like great power in that, but to the extent that you want to make your work relevant to people outside your tribe, it's useful to think about communicating more effectively. The second is trust, and for me, trust is, is so much about transparency. So we can talk about that later. I think if you come to this room, unless you were randomly assigned here, you're already on board on that one, okay? And then the last one is stakeholder engagement, and this might be the hardest one. So suppose we've done everything rigorously and right and, and in innovative ways. We sometimes tell ourselves a story about what the work means, like does it affect Congress, does it affect public opinion, or things like that. One of the things we hardly ever do, and I, I, until recently I was included in this group, we never actually talk to the stakeholders, like, like the people we think this is helping and say, you know, okay, suppose we could convey the work really well. Uh, is this actually helping you? Is this the work, is this the stuff that you need? And I'm not saying we have to be slaves to that, but what we don't get to do is complain about other people not liking what we do, and at the same time that we've never talked to them about what they need, right? We can still do basic research. We can still do really rigorous stuff. But we've got to, you know, if we want other people to support it in a competitive environment, we've got to be somehow connected to the food chain. We don't all have to be on TV. In fact, it's better that most of us aren't, right? Me, myself included. But um, you know, we need to, we need to somehow be able to, to to talk about what it means to the stakeholders. If we do that, right, we've got to, there's a critical role to play because when I when I try to tell people about what the work that we're all doing, right, in one sentence, I say it's the last best defense against wishful thinking. That's what we are, right? <coughs> and wishful thinking is a really powerful societal force, right? It, it controls so much in, in what we do. And we're like, you know, if we do what we're supposed to do in terms of being rigorous and honest and things of that nature, there's so many, you know, the quality of life things that we can do for people, the way that we can change people's lives and make things more efficient, it's really incredible. It's really incredible. So, like, we can make that go away and then have more of that, and it'll be all cool. <laughs> so, anyways, um, thank you for uh, thinking about this, and I look forward to your